New Year's is coming, a time to think about new beginnings and past blessings. It is also time to think about renewing your membership in the Louisville Art Association. Despite the challenges this year, your membership has helped keep the visual arts alive and well in our community. With a combination of online technologies and social distancing, we have continued to offer workshops and art groups. We have held two national shows and three member shows. We have brought the best of our work to our community. Even better days are ahead. As the pandemic comes under control, we will be able to resume the personal interaction we have valued in the past. But with the new video skills we have gained, we will be able to reach out to even more people. This is a dime. This is what it costs each day to be a member. Please renew today and continue to participate in the fellowship and mutual support that this organization provides. If you know other people who are artists or art lovers, invite them into our fellowship as well. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Dawn Hendricks, interim board member for a bit this year and one of the chairs for the national show in September. So all I want for Christmas this year are lots of volunteers. Uh, we also have a photography show in the spring, so please consider volunteering for one of the shows and other events that occur throughout the year. LAA really depends on volunteers to provide the opportunities, the programs for the members as well as the community. And I think the community really does enjoy coming to events and meeting all of the artists and talking to you about your creativity. I was going to um, talk to you about my Nutcracker collection. I started this 40 years ago when my son was born. I bought him one every year and then my husband, I bought him a few and then my daughter came along. And as you can see, there's quite a few here. Um, actually, this is only half of them. When James got married, we shipped his off to him. But as I was putting these out the other day, my daughter's boyfriend uh, was talking about how he doesn't like clowns. And I didn't realize that a lot of people really don't like clowns. And I made the comment that aren't nutcrackers really just clowns that have gotten dressed up for the holiday? I don't know, it looks to me like some of them could be clowns that are in disguise. What do you all think? What I do now is that my daughter's boyfriend does not want me to buy him any nutcrackers now. Um, I want to also take this opportunity to say thank you to all the current board members who were very helpful to me while I was interim. And I look forward to working again with the board in the future. And to all members, stay safe, stay creative, and stay healthy. And I hope to meet you all in the spring. Hi, uh, Meryl Salen. Uh, I moved to Louisville about two and a half years ago. And, well, 2020, I've been mostly in my house. Uh, it's certainly not the best way to move to a new community or make friends. Uh, but LAA, the drawing classes with Helen on Tuesday, uh, fellow members of the group joining the board, I have really felt most welcome and very grateful to have this community. I don't have a committee to thank or volunteers. Uh, I do want to thank all of you though, the members and most of all the board of LAA for all the work they do and all they accomplish. Uh, I've been a professional artist for 40 years. Um, my primary medium is wood. Uh, I carve, paint, I work three-dimensionally. Uh, joining the board was sort of a mutual hope that we could uh, introduce some new art forms and some new workshops to the group. I'm hopeful next year that we will have that opportunity or shortly we'll have that opportunity. Uh, primarily, I wanted to introduce myself and to wish everyone a happy new year and a better 2021. Thank you. 
Hello there, LAA members. This is Kirk Fry, fulfilling one of my final tasks as a board member as I conclude my um, two-year term. Obviously, 2020 was nothing like what any of us has expected, yet it was still pretty successful overall for LAA, all things considered. In particular, our reinstated National Photography Show was a big success. As we've shared before, we had the most pieces entered for any LAA show over the past five years, which helped to make this a uh, profitable event for our organization. And in case anyone wonders why LIA sponsors national shows, there are several reasons, uh, but not the least of which is financial. The two national shows combine for approximately half of all of the income for LAA, so they help to support some of our other programs that aren't uh, profitable on their own. So here's my little pitch. Please consider helping to volunteer at our national shows, even if you don't have a piece that's been accepted. Anyway, I want to give out a few thank yous. First of all, I want to give out a, a major shout out to my fellow co-chair for the National Photography Show, uh, Rich Saxon. Uh, he took care of many show related details, including communications with all of the entrants, managing the call for entries website, as well as numerous tasks involved with the show itself. So thanks again, Rich. We really appreciate your help. I also wanted to acknowledge Cheryl Townsend, who helped immensely with both the unpacking and repacking of the out-of-town entries for both of the national shows, which was a big help. And as far as staffing up the shifts at the photography show, we had a number of people working double, triple, quadruple shifts on multiple days. So thanks to everyone who stepped up and allowed us to keep the doors open, so to speak. Uh, special thanks to Helen Harrison and Lynn Sarkis, who worked a lot of shifts. And finally, thanks to um, Autumn Harrison for her great work in putting together our video reception. She worked with our judge, Jesse McLaughlin, on assembling a lot of video snippets into a single, nice, cohesive video with transitions and title slides and a lot of other editing tricks. Uh, that was really well received by um, everyone who saw that video. Anyway, that's it for me. I've enjoyed serving on the board, but I also look forward to returning to the so-called civilian life of a regular LIA member. Um, I will be helping out quite a bit with the National Photography Show next year. So again, please volunteer. Uh, bye for now, stay safe and happy holidays. Everybody, I'm Steve Markman and I'm responsible for organizing our efforts to produce member programs. As you know, this year was a real challenge. All of our plans for 2020 workshops, dabblers and panda classes were turned upside down and inside out due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, my team came up with an idea and uh, presented a formal proposal to do online classes uh, at the board meeting and the board approved moving forward with them. And this resulted in our ability to provide some uh, well attended art classes while all of us were able to stay safe. It's been quite a joy in fact. I want to give special thanks to all of my team members, uh, Jill Riggin, uh, Nikki Barbie, and Kirk Fry, for all their work in not only creating the original 2020 program, but also transforming it to keep us all safe. So happy holidays, everybody, and here's looking forward to a great 2021. Many people give of their time and talents to make the Louisville Art Association successful. I'd like to recognize two people in particular. Uh, the first is Maureen Risco, who month after month takes our sometimes very last minute and often uh, poorly written submissions and turns them into a beautiful and uh, informative newsletter. She manages the email list to make sure then that that newsletter and all the other information that we send out to our members gets properly distributed. The second person I would like to recognize is Gail Smith. She puts out our member directory uh, several times per year so that we can all keep in touch. And this year in particular, she stepped up to figure out how to do our board of director election online and then made sure that the ballots got sent out properly and the votes were properly counted. So thank you very much to those two people. 
I'd also like to recognize uh, Camilla Pratt and Donna Sorensen for their service on the nominating committee. They lent their wisdom and their knowledge of the organization to help select the best possible candidates for your board of directors for the next two years. So thank you to those people and to all the people that work hard for this organization. Hi everyone, just wanted to put out a word of thanks to volunteers that really helped me this year. Um, Gail Smith is on the top of my list. Uh, she helped put together the virtual shows, get the names out, and helped with the national shows too, which um, she has been a lifesaver for us this year. And she took her time and learned new things, which is never easy. Also, I need to thank Cheryl uh, Townsend and Sheila Fawson for helping me set up the fall show and then taking it back down again, uh, which was a unique experience. But I want to thank the board for trying to uh, make this year as normal as possible and exploring new things to keep uh, the membership going. and. Helen really worked on getting virtual, um, the virtual show going and also getting the uh, drawing workshops and keeping things going for us. Um, then all the other board members who basically did most of the volunteering this year. Um, and we were happy to do it. Um, it was something that just kept the organization going during a time when it seemed like we would have to not do anything. So I also need to thank the membership for applying for the shows and putting your work out there to be seen virtually and judged. And it really uh, brightened up my day to see so many people still trying, you know. Uh, which is all we can do, is just keep going forward. So that's about it for me. I just want to thank everyone and also wish you happy holidays. And hopefully I will see you next year. Um, and just from my boy point of view, the sooner the better. Um, seeing people on a screen is never as nice as seeing them in person. So happy holidays. Uh, hopefully see you next year. Bye. I'm Vince Dean. I've been the treasurer of the Art Association for the last two years. As treasurer, I've come in contact with just about every program we run and an awful lot of people, all of whom did fine hard work and I need to appreciate all of you. But there are a few people I need to acknowledge who made my life as treasurer a whole lot easier. I'll start with the show treasures. The shows are perhaps our most complex activities, a lot of people, a lot of details to get right. This year's show treasurers were Lynn Bergren and Brenda Weissman. Those are the people who come in, set up the sales desks at the beginning of the show every day, then come back in the evening and collect all the materials, take them home and reconcile them, and then put together a detailed report at the end of the show. It's a big job and Lynn and Brenda did outstanding work. I really appreciate it. The cashiers are all the volunteers who work the sales desk. That's another complicated job with a lot of details, with a lot of people demanding your attention. You're too numerous to mention here, but I appreciate everything you did. Lawrence Anderson is our bookkeeper. Now he's not a volunteer, but I do appreciate his care and patience helping us keep everything straight. Lawrence, you did a fine job and, and I appreciate it. Jill Riggan and Nikki Barbie were our workshop coordinators. We all had extra work this year, handling all the changes and then refunds for canceled workshops, all caused by the COVID. There were a lot of details to get right, and I appreciate your help. Finally, I want to thank Gail Smith for putting together the beautiful envelopes that we used for the award checks for some of the shows. Thank you, Gail. I'm sure I've forgotten some people. As I said, almost everyone has something to do with our finances. 
I want to thank all of you. It's unglamorous work. It's behind the scenes. But getting it right makes such a difference, and I do appreciate it. Thank you. My name is Martin Lambeth, and I'm uh, going to be demoing for you tonight my technique that I kind of developed called painting with credit cards. Uh, this style, I, I call it random acts of paint, and I call it that because, first of all, I have an idea what will happen, but I can't predict exactly what will happen when I apply paint with a plastic card. and. I can't duplicate it once I've done it, so it's all totally random and just a lot of happy accidents. So uh, I use old credit cards, room keys, old plastic gift cards. It's kind of unique, uh, but if I do need a brush to get a handle on things, I don't bristle at the thought of using one. Some groans out there. Anyway, the main question I get is, uh, how did I start doing paintings with credit cards or why? And I made some notes just so I could cover it. And here's the, the top five countdown. Number five, I was goofed on NyQuil. Uh, number four, I was looking for a new style to set myself apart from other painters, not be a mimic of whatever teacher I studied with. Well, that one's pretty true because I came from a design and illustration background and when I was asked to do an illustration, the client invariably said, can you match this style and not wanting to turn away any work? You said, oh, sure, I can match that style. So I became very versatile over the decades I was doing graphic design and illustration. And when I started painting again 12 years ago, I uh, found myself almost uh, becoming a colonial instructor because I started matching their style and I was trying to get away from that. Uh, Another reason is I uh, wanted to loosen up. Uh, design and illustration was a lot tighter and a lot more realism involved and I wanted to be more painterly and kind of uh, get more of a looseness to my work. So I experimented with uh, palette knives, various palette knives. 
and it just wasn't fulfilling the uh, vision I had in my head. So I experimented with a lot of different things. I tried spatulas. I tried sponge rollers, but not rolling them, but actually painting with it like a brush. I tried corks. I tried cutting corks, wine corks. Uh, that was pretty much a failed experiment. I never got the handle on that. I did sponges, hunks of cardboard, small pieces of sponge. Uh, I even tried the fuzzy top of Bob Ross's bobblehead here. Uh, it was okay, but I wasn't getting that happy result that you might expect from Bob. It's kind of like a palette knife. Anyway, uh, in regards to the similarities with the palette knife, I think the one main difference is it allows me to apply the paint thinner. So it doesn't go on quite as thick, so it gets more like a brush uh, stroke to it. Uh, and uh, it's more flexible. And I do cut them down to different sizes as well. Uh, depending on the area of detail I'm trying to achieve. So I have that uh, difference between palette knife as well. Anyway, let me talk a little bit about uh, the technique. I paint on a hard board uh, because it, it really does need resistance. I have tried this technique on a canvas like this one back here. You can see how bouncy that is. And because of that bounce, you don't get that same uh, spreading of the paint or the, the random nature of the paint uh, happening because you have to force it on there a lot more. Uh, with the hard surface, it, it just gives that resistance that allows me to get the effect that I'm after. Uh, and I typically start off with a dark black gesso for my surface. Uh, I think for me it helps me evaluate uh, the tonal quality, the values as I'm painting, and I just like seeing how the colors explode out of the darkness, I think more so than off of a white canvas. I think that's why a lot of painters probably tone their canvases uh, before they start. They don't typically start with just a fresh white canvas. They'll tone it with an orange or sepia or some kind of a magenta or some background color just to take that edge off of the white. And uh, when I apply the gesso, I do a, a, a real light coat where I just brush it on to get the whole surface covered, do the edges as well. And then uh, after that's dry, I'll come back on a couple times a little thicker and I make little motions with uh, the brush that are kind of circular as I'm applying it thicker. And that gives me some grooves and those grooves catch the paint. And that gives an illusion, if you're not familiar with how I painted it, it almost looks like strokes of a brush because the paint is gliding over the strokes of the gesso to create that uh, effect. So I started out this technique with acrylics, which I'm gonna be using for this demonstration, uh, primarily because they dry quickly and this technique is really about the layering. There's a lot of layers that go one on top of another and uh, the acrylics dry quickly. I tried oils. I didn't have success at first. I think because the just the viscosity, the oil was thicker. It didn't drag quite the same way and the technique really lent itself to the fluidity of the water media of the acrylics. Uh, but through experimentation I did get to the point where now I can do it in oils. I use an alkyd oil, and that's a quick drying oil. And you add a drying medium to it, like liquin or a cobalt varnish, and that helps accelerate the drying process even more. So uh, I've gotten to the point now where people can look at both my acrylic paintings and my oil paintings and not really see a discernible difference. Uh, I invite you to visit my website, which is www.martinlambeth.com to see samples. 
And I also invite you to follow me on my Instagram account, which is at Lambeth Fine Art. Uh, I got quite a number of posts there and there's quite a few uh, videos, little short videos. There's some that show me painting the portrait type of things. Uh, there's a nice little spot from being on Channel 2 helping them promote the Governor's Art Show. So this particular piece is going to be for a commission. Uh, the client requested a painting since I'm was primarily known for my painting of old trucks and this technique of painting with credit cards I felt really lent itself to old trucks because it gave the feeling of rust and oxidation and the kind of patina that you would get from things being out weathered uh, from rain and snow and wind etc so because of that she wanted to uh, she wanted a painting of aspen trees and she wanted to give a nod to two vehicles her husband was in love with which was a, a 2000 Suburban, Chevy Suburban, and a 1990 Mazda Miata. So let me just clip that down. You'll know what I'll be looking at here off to the side. So since I got Bob there starting up on the sky, I thought uh, that might be a good place to start. So I just kind of load up, hope you can see that, my paintbrush. In this case, it's a room key. I started out with credit cards because that was what I first came across. And now I'm a little snobbish. I kind of prefer the room keys and old expired gift cards. Uh, I don't know where they come from, but the more you look for them, the easier they are to find. Then you get people starting to get save them and give them to you. Uh, so you just kind of load up, like Bob would say, a little ribbon of paint there. And one of the things about uh, painting with credit cards is it's really easy to get a sharp edge. So that's one of the things I'm, I'm really constantly working on is trying to shimmy my brush to get softer edges. And when I do a sky, uh, what I mixed up was uh, white, a little brilliant blue, and a little phthalo blue, just to give it a little more punch uh, than I wanted a less of a purpley sky than I might get with ultramarine blue. And when I do paint a sky, I might go over it uh, minimum three times with different uh, tonal qualities. I might add a little bit of yellow at some point or a little bit more of uh, purple or just a variation. And as I layer it, I start getting more interesting effects. I do a lot of layering and uh, a lot of back and forth and that helps me also control the edges because I'll be able to uh, lay in the background, lay in the foreground shadow, lay in some more background, lay in some foreground midtones, some more background, some foreground highlights, etc. And one of the things that I always tell people when they're painting a large area is to be sure to get a gradation in there. Uh, it just adds a lot more. So I'm going to go a little darker on this side and a little lighter on that side, which there's no particular reason. I just kind of feel like the light is going to be coming from this direction. So it's going to be a lot lighter in this area of the trees than on this side. So I want to get, and this is the shadow area I spoke about. So I kind of want to get a visual contrast between the darker sky and the lighter background, the lighter sky and the darker background. There's really no other reason. And uh, if I get to a certain point in the painting and realize that doesn't look good, then I'll probably go over with more layers. Now, the thing about layers, you can almost put any color you want 
I could come up with any color into the, the background sky as long as you control the values. If they're the same value, you, I could put in a purple, I could put in a pink, uh, and it wouldn't look odd or just out of place because of the values are the same. Now you can, I hope you can see some of these techniques uh, uh, showing up where I'm getting that randomness I spoke about earlier. And then I think you can see a little bit of my palette through this viewfinder, but I'm able to uh, use this as my mixing palette knife as well. So I don't have to keep mixing one, scraping off and cleaning it. Uh, well, cleaning's a, another bonus for this technique. I don't have to wash brushes. Brushes are expensive. I get free brushes in the mail. So there's a lot to be said for developing something that uh, doesn't cost you more time trying to maintain your materials or buying new materials as they become a little used. Okay, uh, to clean off my palette, I have a spray bottle. I just kind of spritz it on there and then I use a paint scraper. I'm painting on a porcelain enamel surface so it makes it really easy to clean up just scoop it off to the side and I don't even worry about the piles of paint because they're off to the side and then I just wash the whole palette after I'm done with the painting session uh, one of the things that I also do with the acrylics uh, is I have uh, small jars and small plastic cups that in particular with the demonstration they start talking, and I don't want my paints to dry out. I can just drop a cup over it, and that helps keep them from drying out too quickly. If I'm painting in oils, and I have some paint squeezed out, they work great for keeping them overnight, because they will start to dry up and get the little film over them on those Alcat paints. So just a little tip for helping to preserve the paint that you have out on your palette. I'm going to grab some other color here. I think I'll try some alizarin crimson. And... Uh, I'm going to maybe lay in a mid-tone. I'm going to mix that with some of my blue, get a purple. Then I'll add a little bit of yellow to help uh, gray it out. Because I don't want a bright purple. I want uh, something just kind of neutral. I'm just still working to get in that kind of a purple that I want to start laying in some of these tree shapes. Now see sometimes I'm uh, doing like little short strokes and sometimes I might treat it more like a brush and make a long stroke. And what I'm doing here is trying to establish where those trees are to give myself a, a visual marker. So as I apply more paint, I have a darker uh, painted representation of the tree trunk, just to give me a little guideline. Ran out of paint, I'm squeezing out a little more. And another thing I like about the acrylics is uh, you can take your paper towel, get it a little bit wet, squeeze off some of the excess water, and just use it like an eraser. 
So it's almost like having an undo button on your computer, which is a nice little bonus, I think, for this particular technique and using acrylics to achieve that. Another thing, the credit card makes it really easy to get some fine lines. So when I get to the point after I get all my big area blocked in on the different backgrounds and stuff, as I go through the process of refining it and developing it, uh, then I'll start doing more details and you can get nice little thin lines just off of the edge of the plastic to simulate branches and grasses and different things like that. So I'm trying to move quickly here. I might uh, take a little more time than what you see me doing at the moment if I wasn't under the time constraints and trying to get as much uh, done on the board to help you see the process. So sometimes I'm I got my thumb on the back side, I'm pushing it. And other times I'm just dragging it lightly. So just through experimentation, you kind of get a feel for what uh, different effects you can achieve, even though you might not know what those effects are going to be uh, when you apply them, as I spoke earlier about calling this random acts of paint. Now, I don't know, Oop. they don't break when you drop them. Sometimes I do a little shimmy back and forth across a larger shape. Uh, really it's kind of unlimited the different ways you can manipulate the plastic card and the paint on the plastic card.
I'm just uh, picking up different, picking up paint from different piles to mix and get uh, variations of the different colors I'm putting down. Now, uh, when you're painting, I'm sure you've heard this and you'll probably already practice it, but one of the things about painting trees is you gotta really be aware of, uh, we tend to fall in, we like things ordered and structured and subconsciously we tend to fall into equalizing things and you can start to get trees that are exactly the same distance apart, which you want to avoid. So you wanna be able to have this a little wider than that, this a little narrower than that, just uh, the same goes, that's talking about the negative space, the space between the trees, but it's equally important on the trees themselves that they're not all like one inch thick or one half inch thick. You wanna have a variation on the thickness of your forms, your positive forms, in this case, the trees as well. Okay, so since I have that blue there and I'm going to go to yellow, I'm going to use that paper towel to wipe my palette off a little more. I don't want to get too much green happening yet. There will be a point where I do want my yellows to tend to more greenish. So I've got some unbleached white, which is Kind of like a light tan that I'll add to some of the yellow. White would make it a little too soft in certain areas. And let's see what else. Uh, a little bit of ochre. I have a couple variations of ochre. I have uh, one that's called bronze yellow that's a darker and then just your regular yellow ochre. It's not quite as dark. Okay. Let's lay in some yellow. Uh, now I'm going to want the yellow less intense in the distance to help provide that feel of uh, depth. And on my uh, reference, that kind of happens here where the focal point is. Uh, that I'm going to be creating with that little white car. And one of the things, I had the white car over more on my original drawing, then I noticed that it was almost dead center, so I moved it just a little off center to help uh, create a little better balance for the composition. You don't really, there's very few times that I'll put something right in the center. And if I do, it was totally intentional with the particular reason behind it, but just one of the things you want to uh, try and avoid in terms of your composition. Okay, now I'm gonna work out from there. I'm gonna squeeze out a little bit of orange too, so I'll have it ready. Because this uh, autumn scene is going to have a variation of yellows, oranges, reds. That's a little too intense in terms of chroma. Uh, another way to help cut the intensity is to add the complement or as I heard at a workshop with Carolyn Anderson, she called it a modifier. So you modify your color with the complement. So purple being the complement of yellow, I'm grabbing just a little bit of purple to help tone the intensity of that yellow chroma down. So 
sometimes you just gotta put a little on the board and see how it looks and then adjust your paint accordingly. So I'm gonna have a mountain back there. I'm gonna have some trees overlapping the mountain. So I'm keeping that in mind as I'm placing my brush to paint. So that's gonna be mountain. I'm gonna have a little overlap here. So I'm gonna bring that up a little higher. Now that I've added that next value, I feel like I kind of got uh, my lighter highlight area lost. So I'm going to come back over that with a little bit lighter. And hopefully you can see some of the layering effect where I got the lighter yellow now on top of the medium yellow. And looking at my reference, I see the trees are going to start coming up higher here again. So uh, I hope you're paying attention to some of the different strokes I'm doing. Sometimes I just do the little drag. shimmy. I flip it over to kind of pull paint off the back side. Uh, there I just dipped it in my water to help uh, add a little moisture to the paint that's starting to thicken up on my palette. And studying my reference again to see exactly what happens with the trees over here, how high up they go. At this point, they start to uh, go up into the sky. And there you see some of that random, random quality of uh, breaking up where it gives you the illusion of the sky behind a uh, body of leaves now. And I didn't really have to labor over it, it just happened, which is uh, one of the unique aspects about this technique painting with credit cards that I really enjoy. Okay, we're gonna start darkening up now as we move to the outside. There's a little angled tree here I don't want to forget that I've got, so I'm just gonna kind of in a little bit of a reminder there. It's nice to break up the verticals with a little, some of the angles. I'll, I'm going to have a, a large one I put in here. Here again, I'm trying to break up that edge. I had a real sharp edge there, and I just saw it and immediately out of instinct went to soften it up with some overlap and some variation in the edge. Here you can see I've switched hands uh, primarily for the camera so you can see better what I'm doing. But I'm using one finger to push down as I'm using the other hand to move things around. Sometimes I'll do that if I want to get something in particular, I'll push it. 
so I'm a two-fisted painter in that regard. I'm getting some really nice textural quality. It almost looks like leaves uh, as opposed to a mass of leaves and some paint quality. It looks like a brush stroke there. Now let's see. I'm, I'm talking about uh, the, the light pattern earlier. So I want to establish some of that on this little hillside that like the shoulder of the road. I'm bringing out some red to mix in with the green I just created from yellow and blue. And it's a little too chromatic on the red, so I'm going to take a hooker's deep, green deep. Green being the complement to red to be my modifier to help uh, tone down the chroma, adjust the temperature to be a little cooler, not quite as warm, get more of a grayish brown. kind of have a feeling like the road's going to come in and curve around us instead of coming straight so I'm going to start to establish that. I don't know if that'll still be the case when I get to the final or I might make a decision afterwards that I'd rather not have that curve. It's just going to be a matter of stepping back, evaluating the composition, seeing how the eye flow goes and what things you need to adjust. kind of like the, the larger blocking technique I do. It's kind of like scrubbing. some little things to simulate the grasses and sometimes I'll put in a splotch like that and then scratch it off turn the card sideways and that kind of gives you hopefully you can see what's happening there a little general idea of if I don't get to that point of detail or that point of finalization during this demonstration, I just want to get that uh, thrown out there. Okay, this is my shadow side. Uh, so I'm using more of that Hooker's Green Deep. And some people have asked me about uh, if I wouldn't just use, keep the, the black gesso, let that show through. Uh, there's certain points where I do allow the, the black gesso to show through, but I won't use it for a primary color on a larger area. It just doesn't have the same uh, vibrancy or punch. And now my 
red pile's been depleted, I'm going to add a little more so I have that to pull from when I need to modify the green. And that's again it's just glitter and crimson at this point. And so far I've been using just one card as I get down to developing it, particularly on the smaller areas of detail, I'll be going to the smaller cards. This is another little technique I do to help on that when I talked about not getting too straight of an edge. I'll kind of put it on there and then flick it up. See, I'm losing some of the lines I've drawn for trees. I'm not too concerned about that. I'll come and look at my reference and put those in after I kind of get the background established. And then again, at that point, I'll be evaluating that thing about equalization that I addressed earlier, uh, making sure that everything's broken up, that they're not evenly spaced, they're wider, thinner, same on the positive shapes. Establish the darker fall foliage and now I'm starting to add that gradation going up this time from darker to the lighter as we come out of that shadow area get that blocked in I think that just gives you really a loose impressionistic representation of leaves as they're thinning out going towards the top part of the limb and branch and twigs. I'll bring up a little more of the cadmium yellow chroma here for areas of where the light's coming through the trees and it's going to be catching more of the leaves, making them appear brighter than the darker leaves. And that's something I'll evaluate as well as I begin to finalize it. I'll decide uh, sometimes you get a lot going on, a lot of patterns, and what you need to do is go in and organize your shapes so we're basically in the block in period of the painting and as I go on and develop it I might this has a nice uniformity to it but as I put in more it could start getting more broken up with too many small shapes and too many different colors so then I'll have to evaluate it and decide how can I organize those shapes so they are harmonious, how they, so they lead the eye, so they work as units within themselves as well as with uh, the other shapes. So I'm sure you heard that painting is just basically shapes. You start with your large shape and then it just refines to the smaller shapes, shapes within the shapes, etc.
I think I should probably start getting that road laid in uh, just to help establish the the large shape so we can then start uh, judging the values between what I blocked in for the background and what it's going to be on the road in the foreground. Now I'm grabbing a little bit of cadmium red and some burnt sienna. Excuse me, that was the paint. And I'm taking some of that hooker's green as my modifier to help tone down the intensity of the chroma. Maybe I'll use this opportunity to grab a smaller cut credit card to show you how I might use it to work the negative space around this little white Miata that's going to be in the foreground. Okay. After I get it all blocked in as well, I'll be uh, making decisions about light patterns. There, I might I'll show you a little bit of that here in a moment after I get the road blocked in. I mentioned it a little bit about the light patterns in the trees, but there's also gonna be light and shadow happening on this road. Sienna, little hooker's green, getting a little darker for over here on the dark side. Sometimes uh, if you get that little bit of ribbon on the edge, you can hold it and drag it and get a larger area of coverage with the smoother smoother finish uh, stroke than the scrubbing technique I was doing prior to that. So that was kind of a little happy accident. That's a nice little light pattern there. And I'll use that as an opportunity to talk about putting in this I'll primarily do a little later in the process, but for the purpose of demonstration. I'm just uh, laying in some of them to give you the idea of how that might be approached uh, a little later in the process. There's going to be a, a large bush here in the foreground, so I'm kind of going to use this uh, mixture created primarily with the Lizard Crimson and Hooker's Green Deep to uh, give me a little background layer for the lighter oranges or yellows that might go on top of that. And it's good to, uh, I call it color dotting, uh, to get some of that color moving around your 
your painting. While I have it mixed up, I'm gonna just throw some in to help, uh, it helps lead the eye around the painting. So now you can kind of see some of that happening. I think we could probably use a little up in here. I'm grabbing some of the bronze yellow, which is my darker version of ochre yellow, yellow oxide. Uh, it help kind of finish blocking in this area behind the truck. And just some of that random thing again that almost just gives the illusion of brush and branches, twigs, trunks, whatever that your eye might interpret it as. And mix a little red in with that and a little more hooker's green with that uh, bronze. To help uh, finish blocking in this shadow side. That's going to be window and windshield area, so I'll let a little of that color bleed into that. Going back to that black base, someone said if you're painting a black truck here, why wouldn't you use that? Well, it just doesn't have the same vibrancy, and I hope the hopefully this uh, little demonstration will allow you to see it on this uh, video. But I like to mix up my own black. Uh, Carolyn Anderson, someone asked her about black she said just mix all your dark colors together uh, what I learned from uh, Kim English that I really like is a black made out of alizarin crimson and thalo green it just is so rich and intense and the other thing I like about that is uh, depending on how much you proportion out your paints uh, if you want it to be cooler you can add more of the phthalo green and if you want it to be warmer you can do that by just mixing in a little more of your alizarin crimson so i don't know if you can see that there hopefully you'll be able to see it when i apply it to the canvas board I can't really tell if you can see the difference between the blacks or not, but trust me, it's uh, so much darker and more intense and richer on the mixed black than what it is on the flat, almost muted, uh, kind of grayed out black. It appears grayed out in comparison to the mixed black. And again, I'm just kind of walking in. I'll pay a little more attention to the details when I go to finalize it. Uh, I'm not really too concerned if it doesn't fill the whole area that I'm trying to fill with black. If it does break up a little bit and has some of the other blacks showing through, that just gives it interest. Uh, which reminds me of another point about uh, painting darker areas. Like if you're painting a barn and you have a dark interior of the barn or the hayloft is a darker area. It's always nice to add some interest to that dark area by introducing uh, a, a burn number, a burnt sienna, an alizarin crimson, something to give it just a little more than just a hole. You don't want it to look like a hole in the painting. And by adding those darker colors of color notes, you get that interest. 
Now I'm mixing that black that I have with a little bit more of the alizarin just to warm it up some to utilize it for the shadow area. some of that dark over in here because I know I'm gonna have trees coming over the top of that and I want to have lighter trees as though they're catching the light I got a great little broken up area here that looks like tree leaves so I'm trying to maintain that uh, and not go over it again and I'm gonna bring some of that darker over to this side Get that little shoulder of the road happening. Let's see. Uh, I'm gonna grab a smaller brush here and some of that dark mixture black and lay in the interior up to the dashboard this would be like what's behind the front row of front seats some color on that. I added a little more of the phthalo and a touch of unbleached white to lighten it up. Uh, my thought was that uh, you're gonna have the blue reflected off of the sky onto the top of this and once you have blue hitting that darker black it's not gonna really be so much blue can be, have a little bit more of a green tint to it. There will be areas that when I get to the final, there's going to be reflection of the uh, yellow foliage as well. Then I'll probably come and drop in across the top like I'm demonstrating here. Just, uh, I'll refine that later, but that gives me a reminder that I want to be able to do that on the final. kind of creating an undertone here for the chrome area so some of this light green will show through when I get the lighter and darker grays on top of it where that mountain's going to be and I'll refine that later as well so I hope that was an enjoyable presentation for you I hope it didn't run too long and I hope when I get done and turn it off that there is a recording on this device. Thank you very much. And again, please follow me on Instagram at Lambeth Fine Art. And check out my website, www.martinlambeth.com. Thank you.